Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. I want to thank uh, Peggy O'Kane and the NCQA for the opportunity to come and speak at this session about imagining and reimagining cancer care. First, I'd like to say I agree with Otis about everything. Uh, but second, I, I have to say imagining and reimagining are my favorite things to do. I think they are the first and most essential ingredient of a recipe for change. Because if you can't imagine it, you can't make it happen. So 25 years ago, after I finished all my surgical and medical oncology training and my MBA, learning about how other well industries do things, I imagined that care should be tailored to biology, patient preference, and personal performance. So what I want to do today is take you through the lessons I've learned along this journey of trying to focus on these three pillars of biology, the importance of paying attention to what patients want, and the critical importance of feedback on performance. And finally, I'd like to close with a prescription for change. So you heard from Otis about the importance of understanding biology and how, much we've, how far we've come in understanding more about cancer. Clearly, cancer is not one disease. We have those at low risk, and we have those cancers that we know are most likely to kill you. But our knowledge turns are way too slow. It takes at least 10 to 15 years to get a new drug to market. For those people most at risk to die early of their disease, we should not be content with that kind of a knowledge turn. The people I see face to face don't have 10 years for us to get our act together to figure out how to get something new on the market. So we have to think about it. What's wrong with our process? Our process is that we start all new treatments at the stage four setting in the metastatic disease. That's where we look for whether or not it works, when that's actually an almost impossible situation to fix. But we know if we move those drugs earlier in the treatment that we actually save lives. Now, I'm a surgeon, and I'd love to believe that I have the answers to fix everything, but in fact, I'm an advocate for my patients first. So someone at risk to die of systemic disease, meaning that the cancer is going to spread to other parts of their body, is not going to be fixed with surgery alone. So that should tell us that you have to start with that systemic treatment first. So not only should we be moving the treatments, the testing of these treatments earlier in the disease process, like to the early stage, stage two and three, but we should focus on those cancers that are most likely to kill you, get the denominator right, and figure out then how to reverse order of therapy so that you learn in the course of care. This is what we did for the iSPY trials, where we're trying to revolutionize the way we test drugs, we get the right drug for the right patient, and we do it much faster. That means a lot of our processes have to change. Because even in the high-risk setting, cancers are not all the same. So these new drugs are not necessarily going to work for everyone. And it's much better to have that population of people for whom those drugs work and give that narrow population and allow that testing to go forward. So we need a whole new process for that. We need to have platform trials where the drugs keep rolling in at the same time. You can trust, test more than one drug at once. Every new protocol doesn't require a new, new, uh, a new, um, uh, a new trial that we can be much more efficient, that we can really make team science bring better treatments to our patients. So early indicators, platform trials, tailored biology, adaptive learning, that's what we need. I was uh, talking to a friend of mine, uh, and uh, who was taking care of one of my friends who had lung cancer, and we were bemoaning the poor outcomes with stage three uh, lung cancer. And I said, doesn't that make you want to run a trial? Why not, why not do like what we've got for iSpy? Why not start testing these drugs earlier? And he said, Laura, we have to start with the standard of care first. And I had to say, really? Because the standard of care is so great? You know, I, I have to say, you look at all these new drugs coming forward. Why are we waiting? What are we afraid of? You have to be willing to say that what you're doing is not so good, because otherwise you're not willing to change it. So I think the new standard should be standard of care plus new agents, and then start dropping out the toxicity and be imaginative and get pipeline trials and platform trials to bring efficiency to the market. But now, on the other side of biology, just as important as the people who are at the greatest risk of dying of their disease, we also have to focus on those people who need less care or less intervention or maybe no intervention at all. 
And we want to make sure that the interventions we're using are really effective. So um, I would say that um, one of the things is a huge trial, as Otis was just saying, that these genomic tests, these molecular tests, have now gotten us un to understand who needs more care and who needs less care. The MindAC trial was an enormous effort in Europe to try and say, what happens to people who are biologically low risk, but clinically high risk, even up to three positive nodes, do they benefit from chemotherapy? And the answer is, not really. Very little. And that's important, because you can have risk, but you have to know, what should you do about that risk? We have this American mentality that, I'm going to fight it, I'm going to do everything, I'm going to throw everything at it. But you don't want to just cause toxicity and not be having an impact. That's important. And then even further, what about those people who actually have very little or no risk of dying of their disease. We have to redefine what cancer is in 2017, just as Otis said. And we actually have a molecular tool. We've developed a threshold on that same 70 gene panel that says this is a cancer that's not going to kill you, even if you wait 25 years and don't have treatment. We don't benefit from finding those people early. And I can tell you one thing, we're not going to benefit from finding the precursors of those cancers. So all the stuff that we call ductal carcinoma in situ, or pre-cancer, at least half of that, if not more, is not something we need to find. So we need to change what we're looking for. So that brings me, you know, and, and again, we have to have as much evidence to intervene as to not intervene. Our first standard is, oh, oh let's do something. They're so afraid of missing something. But we also have to be aware of the problems that we cause. So that brings me to screening. So, you know, one size doesn't fit all in treatment. It can't possibly make sense that we should screen everybody as if they do. But what's our standard? Everybody gets a mammogram starting at age 40. Well, maybe someone who's at really high risk for the disease needs to be screened differently and earlier, and people who are low risk for the disease don't need to be screened at all, or much less, right? So let me give you what I think is a great analogy. How many people flew here today or yesterday to get to this meeting? How many of you use PreCheck? Do you love pre-check? OK. We, the University of California president, Janet Napolitano, developed pre-check when she was the Secretary of Homeland Security. When you get to the office, so we are used to having a system where risk is key to processing. Shouldn't we be doing that And the way we think about cancer? Our goal isn't to find everything. And when you get a mammogram or you get a scan, it's not to find out what everything is on that scan. It's to find the things that, are on the, that should be on the no-fly list, right? That's what we should be looking for. So in screening, you have to have a balance of risk, benefit, and cost. So uh, about six years ago, all the University of California medical centers banded together. We developed this network called the Athena Breast Health Network. And our goal was to try and integrate the processes of care and research and to integrate what we've learned in treatment all the way back to screening and prevention. And we've just launched our first trial called the Wisdom Study, Women Informed to Screen Depending on Measures of Risk. Makes the, makes the acronym still work. But really what we need is wisdom and not rancor. We have to move forward. We have to be willing to try new things. And this is an idea of saying a personalized screening is better, is going to be better than just annual screening. And we're going to use all the modern tools that we have, understanding about Inherited risk, which is uncommon, but important. Shouldn't you find the people at most risk to start with? And that's not just the mutations, but the small variation in risk. You know, they've spent 30, 30 million euros testing these things in Europe. Why is that not in practice? Or why is that not put to the test? And we're running a modern era platform trial using the Salesforce platform and analytics and low cost genomic testing because we want to find out if it's just as safe. And if it's less morbid, we do less interventions. And if, in fact, uh, it will be better and something that we can move forward. Two of the key things about this trial that I think are important is the first is everyone's around the table. All the people who make policy guidelines are going to be at the table, including your fearless leader, Peggy O'Kane. And the whole question here is, if the results are a certain way, we're all going to agree up front to the change in care. We're not going to spend five or 10 years arguing about whose religion is right and so on. 
These are the results. Everybody sees them, right? That's one of the things that's critical. Uh, and it might surprise you to know that the argument about screening is over data that's 40 years old. So we need something new. And by the way, screening is expensive. About $10 billion a year to screen annually in the United States. So the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute is uh, one of the funders of this trial, but they don't fund all the new tests. It turns out that what we're proposing is a much more cost-effective solution. Better quality, lower cost. That's healthcare value. So what we're doing is asking the payers to step up. Everybody has to change. The providers have to change. The patients have to change, but so do the payers. We should repurpose the money that's in the system and make it work for us. Blue Shield of California has stepped up to create a coverage with evidence development uh, plan. We're finding it a challenge to get all the others to come on board, but we will, because that's what everyone should be doing, is trying to make it better. And the self-insured employers, UC Care, University of California stepped up, Salesforce has stepped up, Genentech stepped up, and that's just the beginning. But this is a new way of testing things. So I want to move to my second pillar, which is about patient preference. If biology is different, so is every person. We have to be mindful of the impact of our therapies. But we also have to be mindful of what everybody brings to the table and how we figure out, how we learn about what's important to patients. So we have used something called, we've used something called consultation planning uh, for medicine. And this was developed by one of my colleagues, Jeff Belcora. And one of the things that happens is when patients come to the consultation, they need to know what's on their mind. We often don't figure out that, and we have no mechanism for that. But if someone comes in as a scribe for that uh, and prepares them for their consultation, in a minute, I can figure out what's important. Do they have a child at home? Do they have an elderly person they're caring for? What are the concerns that they have? And I can know in a moment and meet them where they are. And we can help that person take notes in their in their, uh, in their consultation. And we use pre-medical interns and, and patients and, and students who are interested in going into medicine using a whole industry, our patient support core. And these people learn how to walk in the shoes of the patients. That's actually really important. So we have to figure out how to think about what's important. Because actually, our therapies I found most people don't like what we have to offer. And we need to find therapies with less toxicity. We have to listen to what they fear most and leads to better treatments. They're powerful motivators for change. I, most of the things that I've worked on changing came directly from patients. The mastectomies we perform, people said, why do you have to take all the skin? Why do you have to remove the nipple skin? Why does that matter? And we were able to figure out how to do it differently, leading to huge improvement in cosmesis. People who are afraid of losing their hair. You know, it's the toxicity that people fear most. 10% of people actually not do chemotherapy because they're afraid of losing their hair. The scalp cooling devices could be tested. We actually ran a trial of getting FDA approval. And one of the reasons why people didn't want to use it, they said, oh, well, what if they got a scalp metastasis? That's such an unlikely event when what people really cared about is they didn't like their privacy being invaded. They wanted to move forward or paying attention when people say that they have pain or they have a complication. Find way to treat post-mastectomy pain. It's real, and these are really things that make a huge difference. Of course, it's better not to do it in the first place, but if you have a problem, then you can do it. And active surveillance. You heard what Otis was talking about. Not everybody wants an intervention. Four out of five biopsies turn out to be nothing and benign. It's pain, it's anxiety. My inbox is full of people saying, oh my gosh, can you help me? I don't want to have a biopsy, or I don't want this treatment. Can you help me watch it? These are things that we should pay attention to. That makes, that makes a big difference. Not everyone is, interested, is worried about the same things you are. One of my young patients said to me, she had a very high-risk cancer, didn't have a great response to therapy. Is she worried about recurrence? No. She's worried because her long-term relationship just broke up and she wants to have a family. And she says, how do I start again? My boobs are fake and my eggs are in a jar. How's that for an opening line? <laughs> so wouldn't it be better for us to be working harder on developing treatments that are less toxic? And those drugs exist. We actually graduated one of them from the iSpy trial. But you know, the incentives aren't lined up to have drugs that are just as effective but less toxic and to get them to the market on time. 
That's a shame. And we're going to have to work in fixing that. So I want to move to my third pillar. And my third pillar is about clinical performance. So feedback is critical for performance. Variation in care, why do we have so much variation in care? Because people actually have no idea what the person in the room next to them is doing. Can you imagine running any business if you had no feedback on performance? Well, welcome to medicine. That's how we do it. And you know what it takes is a heroic effort to collect the data that we need. In fact, we have to go to our institutional review boards, or our committees on human research, to get permission to publish our data on our outcomes. Isn't that crazy? It should be the other way around. We should have to go to the IRB to not publish and look at our data. That's what people want. We want to know what we're doing and how to make it better. And we have to be mindful of financial toxicity. It's over for us to be able to say, oh, well, we didn't really know how much that cost. And we didn't know you would have to pay that for an out-of-pocket. We have no idea. And it's not even being taught in medical schools. So how many people here, either themselves, are in a fantasy football uh, league, or have children or friends who are in a fantasy football league. Okay. So think about all that data that you have access to. We don't have it. So that's why I say we need Moneyball for medicine. And that's how we're going to speed knowledge turns in this industry. So I say we have to innovate and be unsatisfied. And we have to make a change. So I'm going to recap, and I'm going to then give you a prescription for change. So the first is that we have to, um, uh, um, the first thing that we need is one size does not fit all. Everybody knows that. Biology and science can be the driver for care. And then we have to get feedback from performance, feedback from our patients and from our own clinical efforts and get feedback on performance. And what we need to do is think about practicing a different kind of medicine. 25 years ago, when I joined and started practice. Most cars guzzled gas, and uh, cell phones were the size of bricks, right? Think about that. And about 45,000 women died of breast cancer every year in the United States alone. So today, cell phones, smartphones are everywhere. There are electric cars everywhere. And guess what? Almost as many women still die of breast cancer. If we're going to find the right treatment for the right person, at the right time, we're going to have to make some real changes. We need different tools today, and we need a different culture. The doubling time for knowledge is months, not years. We cannot accept 10 to 15 year knowledge turns. That's unacceptable. We have to practice a new kind of medicine. We have to focus on healthcare value and find ways to allow people to innovate. Better outcomes that matter to patients for less cost and less toxicity. That means more for some, less for others, and more affordable for everyone. So the University of California and uh, the University of California as an institution, the Quantum Leap Healthcare Collaborative, Salesforce, the FDA, we're teaming up to form a collaboratory for accelerating learning in medicine. And what we want to do is re-engineer the process of care and collection and integration and reuse of mission-critical data with a patient-centric data hub so that feedback is a routine of care, so that platform trials are a routine of care, that knowledge turns are faster. I am sick and tired of watching other industries outpace innovation and healthcare delivery. We probably invest maybe less than 1% in innovation and healthcare delivery, and it's time for that to change. And we need to get to the next generation and train them to understand different things so we can scale up these kinds of changes. The Affordable Care Act has made a big difference in allowing access to care, and that's great. But that's not going to fix the cost and quality problem. What has to happen is we need to take our profession back, and we have to line up the incentives and change the culture so that we can drive change and innovate and unleash the next generation and ourselves and our own imagination and figuring out solutions that make it better. So together, Patients, because everyone's a patient, providers, researchers, industry, we all need the same thing. We can imagine a better future. And we invite all of you to join us to make it pass. Thank you.